Uh, welcome, everybody. I think we've probably got everyone who's joining us now. Um, this is the last in our series of the We Are Working On, uh, and in a way, it's We Are Working With, uh, rather than We Are Working On, uh, the subject of prayer. So um, straight over to you, Helen. Uh, if you're going to open with a prayer, that's great. Otherwise, you can just launch in. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Um, I am just going to launch in because what I have to say. Uh, now, I want to just. Um, can everybody see that? Great. OK, so um, I'm not going to start with a formal prayer, but I just wanted to reflect on part of my journey through this whole business about public witness and prayer, because for me, praying visibly outside in a space that um, outside of the church community was um, a real challenge. Um, wasn't something I ever expected to find myself doing. Um, and so I've been surprised by where it's taken me. And looking back and then thinking about the most recent time when we have prayed together, um, but in public, using vigil, um, I shared this with a couple of people on the screen here, but I was really um, taken aback by how somehow now, if I kneel down on a piece of tarmac, I am much more quickly into a contemplative space than anywhere else. So that, um, you know, the pews, the, the places that you would I would normally expect to find myself, I don't find that it's not a direct line to gob that direct line to the place inside of me that can connect with the sacred. And if someone had told me five years ago that that would be kneeling on a piece of tarmac that frankly never looks as clean as the picture you've got in front of you there, <laughs> but and, and, and usually isn't dry, um, I just would have laughed. So th there's something in all of this business of vigil that has been a journey for me. And I feel like I'm going to be going through some stuff which is teaching grandmothers and fathers to suck eggs, quite frankly, looking at all the people who are in this group, because you've all been there and done that. Um, so this is just really a bit of, I think this will come as a bit of an introduction to us sharing some of our thoughts on where we found ourselves in strange places. So I'm just going to use the pictures really as a prompt. And this picture is a prompt for me to say that I have found deep peace in vigil. Um, and it has brought me to a completely new and unexpected place of contemplation. And I think we are in the footsteps of the great and the good. My first ever public prayer um, outside of St. Paul's was um, in union with people from other faiths, um, including the great Rowan Williams. So there we are in Paternoster Square. And that was quite a challenge for me. I was in my dog collar. I was fairly recently ordained. I was carrying my palm crosses and I was surprised by the engagement of others from all faiths and none with what we were doing and with what I represented as a priest in that space. Um, so this is the most recent moment and you can see Hillary there and Melanie was there and lots of very very familiar faces but I, I've just picked popped this picture in because it is my most recent moment and that is when I realized that there's something about sticking my prayer stool down on my mat and dropping to my knees into paving slabs tarmac whatever the space is that um, as a result of praxis I think has become um, part of my toolkit, my my spiritual toolkit, and um, that has, as I've already said, surprised me. It normally takes me quite a long time to get into that centred space. 
So for me, there's something going on and it's to do with other people as well, of course, and shared experiences because I have shared experiences with all those people in that picture. Um, but it has evolved and changed and it can be both in person and online. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that um, capacity for online and in person and the sharing of that being so powerful. And I know there are people here who've been on both ends of that. So to know that we can set up for ourselves a space where some people are there in person holding a physical space, but other people are holding a non-physical space, but it is shared across those those, those settings. Uh, I particularly like this picture here of, of Jill. And if your own pictures aren't in front of it, you can see there we are with the tripod and the Zoom, and there we are in Glasgow. And I think that during that particular vigil, which was daily, um, there was a real building of solidarity across all of those who were either joining on Zoom or coming in person. Um, and that's something I think it would be interesting to explore as to how we maintain that. And it is maintained, obviously, partially by the fact that we went on to Zoom as Christian Climate Action in the early days of the pandemic. Um, but it, it's not just the kind of CCA things that, that can do that. This is um, my local faith at the gate. And again, we found now that we have people who wish to join us on Zoom, and that's continued post-COVID. And again, draws people into the idea of prayer being a powerful thing, but not necessarily confined to Christians. So this is a mixed group from XR and from CCA. Um, and from pagans, and from anybody involved with a particular site, but there's an acceptance of vigil and prayer and contemplation as a practice that is acceptable to all and will not exclude anybody. And that's where thinking about language used and so on feels obviously very, very important. Uh, but that has also connected a particular site with a wider audience, so to speak, because that's my local patch. And again, small is beautiful. Again, on my local patch, this vigil idea was picked up. I can't remember which one it followed on from, but we called it in Dorking, Pause for the Planet. And we pray together in our own traditions and we invite passers-by to join us. So that will be a familiar model to you. But this is really, you know, this is local. This is Dorking High Street and this is Barclays in Red Hill. So... A, a small group of people gathering to be still together. And I'll talk a little bit about how we've managed some outreach as well, because otherwise um, it's not necessarily clear why one's there. But with the pause for the planet, that happens every two weeks in Dorking. And sadly, we haven't really drawn in local churches, but we have drawn in local people. So it's not particularly reaching out to the church communities, but it is reaching out to those who feel the same grief, I suppose, as people within XR. So it has reached out, but not interestingly to church communities. And I think that would be an interesting thing to discuss on a practical level. Then there's the power of going to the vulnerable places. This is um, a lock on. And I just want to talk a little bit outside of the vigil model of our rituals that are so powerful and taking the Eucharist to this space was um, an extraordinary experience for me to celebrate just the other side of that tower and that line of police officers. Um, and then the whole practical business of asking permission to do what we're doing of those around us who might otherwise not wish to be included in prayer or worship of a Christian nature never ever ever had any pushback ever and always um in the end had amazing um conversations after people have seen us worshiping together so that's taking it slightly outside of the vigil and the prayer action because that tends to be something people observe and move away move on from but if we take one of our pieces of worship and i'll talk a little bit more about that into the public space i'm amazed 
when there's all this talk in our denominations about, you know, fresh expressions and so on, how instantly this is an interesting and acceptable um, thing to be doing. Most recently in Downing Street, when the citizens, the People's Assembly was happening and our People's Assembly was our communion. Um, and I was very aware that we were doing something different within that People's Assembly for reasons which weren't planned, but that's how it happened. And then going to the other groups who'd been around us holding a, a proper People's Assembly uh, to say, you know, I really hope that that was OK. We didn't mean to be at odds with what you were doing. It felt like the right thing for us. And we, we had our timings um, set to do that at that point. And the sheer kind of gratitude from those other groups and acceptance that this was something we were doing and and enjoyment of having had that happening on their peripheral vision. Um, so within the, the same conversation about things that we can do that draw in others. So vigil, I think is, and it'd be interesting to hear what the others, is a, um, a witness, but then there is a type of witness that draws in others. And the foot washing is an example of that. That's happened um, on two or three occasions now. And Ha gives rise to very different sorts of conversations. Um, and I just had to put the rainbow over. Um, <laughs> just had to had to put it. No, it's not a rainbow, but whatever it is, the lovely, the lovely red. I suspect Tim took that. Uh, but again, um, there we are in Parliament Square and the police are beginning to move in. I think this is very interesting in terms of the police crime and sentencing bill is that, you know, where will our vigil, which doesn't quite tick their boxes of being irritating and noisy, fit in the future as they clamp down increasingly on forms of protest. I've got this kind of rather cheeky feeling that our vigil might be become quite a powerful thing that might cause some, um, some real co uh, conversations and confrontations that, you know, legally could become very interesting part of anything else. So I think, I think we might have something up our sleeves, so to speak, that they haven't thought of. Um, ashing outside of um, Westminster Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, you know, back in the day, so to speak. But again, visibly taking our Holy Week um, out into the public domain. So that's both our prayer and our practice of all the things that we do in Holy Week, the foot washing. And of course, this is relevant because it will be coming up next year. I'm not quite sure when rebellion is, but... I don't think it coincides next year, but when it does coincide, I think it's a gift to us. Um, and here is how I began this beautiful from XR invitation to pause, which really I think XR has largely lost, but um, we, I think we're holding that light now. I think we're holding the light that was started by the visioning group um at the in the early days of xr and i know in my local group um people really still expect that that's something we will do and that i will be involved in that in some way and it's really treasured so i think we have a treasure here for the xr community that has been allowed has fallen a bit by the wayside in, in the mainstream of xr um but that we we can hold along with the other faith groups um and I think that's really, really special. And it was really special for me. It's what drew me into XR was this, the power of silence and the power of acknowledging the sacred. And in, with this pause was my very first experience of dropping to my knees on that tarmac where I found that treasure. And it was um, outside Downing Street, seemed to keep ending up there. Um, and uh, it was a it was a holy ground moment for me. I still get quite choked up thinking about it because I wasn't with other Christians. I was with a completely mixed group. I didn't really know anybody. I'd just gone along. And at the moment this was offered, this pause, um, everybody to a person dropped their knees. And I couldn't believe what was happening to me. And I not, you know, I was completely overwhelmed. And I still go back to that moment to think. This is treasure in the tarmac. This is stuff where we step into our power in a very visible but very different way. And again, you know, with with the clampdown on protest, I think this is a really interesting thing to explore. And 
we, we can do it in such an inclusive way because we don't need to use words. You know, we go beyond words and we're in that tarmac and in that space. So that was really, really important for me. And I hang on to some of these words, really, because that's what it's about for me. Um, I wanted to put something in about practicalities because I'm sure everybody on here has now has experienced a, um, something and I, I'm preparing something for our um, diocese. So I, this is in there because of that. But the practicalities we can talk about if you want to, but all of these things matter where where you choose to do it. We do it outside the Dorking War Memorial, but we're very careful not to be there around remembrance. So it's those sensitivities about when and where is the right place to be. Um, having somebody to facilitate um, and do some outreach so that others can actually pray. I think that's quite important and to decide on that beforehand, because otherwise you can end up all of yourselves, you know, trying to do both um, the timings, the breaks, um, depending on the group, are you going to pray out loud? That's what we did outside Christian Aid. It was a fully Christian group and we prayed together um, and that was extemporary prayer. That's not always appropriate. So those sorts of things. Staying warm. I hope you can see the picture of Ben all wrapped up. <laughs> have, a, have a poncho <laughs> and ha have a hot water bottle, all the things we've got used to doing anyway and zooms and tripods and not letting your tripod blow over and all those sorts of things I think everybody on this call probably knows about but I'm happy to talk more about them if if necessary and that's me done thank you Helen that was really enlightening I think there'll be lots of questions but rather than take questions after each uh segment we'll take them all together so Hilary can I just hand over to you you can um I shall try and share a picture in a moment but um, I'm just going to talk a bit first so um I am going to start with a bit of theology Helen <laughs> um I'm starting with Moses because what I've been thinking about is the the unexpected sacred space and and holy ground and thinking about the way that Moses was walking through a very ordinary bit of wilderness with a very ordinary bunch of sheep, when all of a sudden God chose to reveal himself to Moses in that place. And he invited Moses into that. And Moses was with it enough and tuned into God enough that when God said, come closer and take off your shoes because this is holy ground, that Moses was up for being part of that. And I think that's, in my experience, that's a really big part of what we do is to some extent creating the sacred space by walking into wherever it is we're walking into, whatever bit of tarmac we're kneeling on and saying, I, I'm here, Lord, this is, this is who I am. I am listening to you in this time and this place and that that creates sacred space um so so that there's really something big for me about the sacrament of the present moment I don't know if you've heard about this but there was back at the end of the end of the 17th beginning of the 18th century there was a Jesuit priest called Jean-Pierre de Corsard who who is worth a read in my humble opinion and he talked about the sacrament of the present moment which in very simple terms is just being, being aware and prepared to admit that God can reveal himself in all places and all times really ties in with Ignatian spirituality, which talks about finding God in all places. And I think if we're up for it, we take something of that with us when we go out to any sort of protest, whether it's actively Christian or not. And there is something about it that can very easily draw other people in. So one, um, I'm going to tell you a story in a minute, but um, th this, this was something, it was something that happened as part of a JSO protest. But I found myself in a safe house with several other CCA people. And it just so happened that one of the evenings we were there was the evening that CCA Compline was happening. Um, there were a limited number of electronic devices in the house because we're not encouraged to take those with us. 
And we asked if it was okay to borrow the house iPad and to to, to share Compline in the main room that, that we were all kind of sharing for everything. And everybody agreed that was okay. And it was absolutely beautiful as one person after another who were not people of faith at all said, oh, can I come and join in? Can I be part of this? Is that all right? And then after that, we the, the group of us, five Christians, I think, in the house, met together every evening to say Compline as far as we were able. And gradually, a lot of the rest of the house came to join us simply because they recognized something in that space that I would call sacred and holy. They might well have called something different, but they could see the good in it and they wanted to be part of it. And that was really special. I'm going to attempt to share my screen and then I'm going to tell you a little story. Can you see that? So this was, as you see, a Just Stop Oil protest. I, I'm actually somewhere behind the banner in that. Um, that was what was going on. And if I can move it, that, that was what I could see uh, as this was happening. So th this is a blog post that I wrote um, after reflecting for a few weeks coming back from this. So apologies to those of you who've already read the blog post, but I, I think the words that I chose to write then still express very well what I experienced of sacred space and holy ground. I am sitting on the ground. I like sitting on the ground, whether it be grass, carpet, wood or stone. But today, unusually, I am sitting on tarmac. Smooth to drive on or ride a bike. But as I sit on it, I am very aware of the rough unevenness the loose bits of gravel and the chill that makes even a folded up newspaper a welcome layer of insulation. Of course, roads weren't designed to be sat on. And as people other than us want to use this one, my expectation is that we will not be here for very long. I am part of a roadblock, part of a group of about 70 people who firmly believe that our use of fossil fuel is making the planet unlivable and are prepared to put ourselves and our freedom at risk by causing a little disruption and maybe being part of bringing about the deep systemic change that is needed to give future generations a chance to experience fullness of life. All around me, people are glued on to the rough and uneven road or to the people with whom they have been sitting. I have been too slow to act and so have both hands free. As time goes on and we are not removed from the road as quickly as expected, my two free hands find work to do. A prayer has been written specifically for this sort of situation. Can I root in someone's backpack to find it as their single free hand cannot reach? So as we sit, we pray. And gradually those around us join in with the repeated refrain of the prayer, just stop oil. The prayer comes to an end and we start to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Many people know this song and from all corners of the roadblock, gentle voices can be heard. One or two of the police officers smile and start to join in. But catching my eye, at least one decides that perhaps she shouldn't be seen to do this and stops with a slightly sheepish glance. We have been sat on the road for a couple of hours. People begin to get out water bottles, insulated cups and snacks. Next to me, a friend is glued on with both hands. She has thought ahead and brought a cup of hot tea. Can you give me a drink? She says. As I hold the cup to her lips and tip it gently forwards, I am reminded of pre-COVID days when we could drink from the common cup as we shared wine at the Eucharist. I remember finding it hard to know how far to tip the chalice when someone would not or would, did not want to hold it for themselves. I don't want to cover my friend in tea this chilly morning, but nor do I want to stint on giving her what she needs. 
we manage. Someone passes round a box of flapjack. In this kind of setting, all things quickly become communal and shareable. I take a piece, break it, and offer it to my glued on friend. She opens her mouth and I feed her. My fingertips brushing her lips as I try not to lose any of the crumbs. There is something very intimate about putting food into the mouth of another human being. An awareness of vulnerability and relationship. I'm suddenly very conscious of the balance of power between me, my friend, the others around us in the roadblock and the police. And it makes me uncomfortable. I think of the churches where the communicant kneels with open mouth, waiting for the priest to place the bread on their tongue. And I am glad that here we are both sitting down on the road, on a level with one another. There was no pre-planned intention that this morning would be Eucharistic, but we have gathered, acknowledged in song our need of God's grace, prayed for the world and shared food and drink. And I, at least, am thankful. It still makes me quite emotional thinking about that, actually, as you might have noticed. It's um, thinking about it now, and this is a bit off the cuff. It's amazing how often food is important in those situations. The communal sharing of flapjack has become a bit of a standing joke if you're on any sort of protest. And it's great. And I'm just remembering another occasion when we were keeping vigil, the Lent before we went into lockdown, when we started keeping vigil 24 seven on the pavement outside the Houses of Parliament. And I found myself on my own there one day. And to be fair, I was a little bit scared at doing that on my own. There was um, someone else around, a guy who was protesting about something else. I can't remember what, but he had a banner and then he was heading off down to one of the embassies for a little while. I'm sure somebody else will remember who he was and what he was doing. Um, when he came back from the, the embassy, he was obviously someone who was, if not homeless, then very vulnerable. And on the way back, he'd called into a local place where um, people who are in need can pick up food. Um, Pret is one of the places that gives their, their spare food. And when he came back, he'd called in there but he'd picked up two boxes of food and he came back and handed one to me. That was a truly holy moment as well. I think I'm gonna stop there and just, just leave you with the story and let, um, let Tim fill in the gaps. Thank you, Hilary. However many hot times I hear that, I'm so, so deeply moved. So thank you for uh, sharing us that with us again and the, and the grace of that. Uh, Tim, a hard act to follow, but I'm going to hand over to you. A very hard act to follow. I don't see many gaps there. It was, it was really moving. Um, so I think I think when Mel originally sort of, uh, sort of pitched the idea that we were doing this, I think she said vigil, and I hinged on vigil, but of course it is all about prayer. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just going to sort of echo some of the things that Helen Hillary has said, that, that that acknowledgement that we're making ground holy. So I'm part of the group of people that does the vigil or tries to do the vigil when Parliament is sitting and we try and have a presence between 11 and 3 on the Wednesday, which is uh, the day with Prime Minister's questions time. So there's always a lot of activity. Um, always for a little bit guilty that we're doing sort of quite high status sort of place whereas I know um our friend from XR Buddhist Satya did a whole year in uh, Malvern um sitting once a week I think um leading up to COP and she didn't have the glamour of parliament whereas people we're part of the zoo down there there's an awful lot going on as Hillary was just saying um and the vigil did grow out of the uh, as I'm sure many of you know what we were doing Lent 24 seven and then had to take online um, when COVID hit and of course which led to this presence of us all being online at the moment. So I, I just thought four reasons why I do it. Um, first being is 
and it's come, what I've come to understand is what we're doing. And Helen's already mentioned, and Hillary is the is acknowledgement. This ground is holy. It wasn't holy before I started being there. It's just I'm bringing witness to the fact that even a smelly place like Parliament Square is holy and God is present. And that's one of the things I pray about. And I think Mel put me onto this. That she's, you know, when I remember chatting to her after one night she'd been there and she was talking about <laughs> breathing in the fumes. And you are, you are literally breathing in what everyone's pumping out um, and holding that space. And uh, similarly to as Helen said, it's getting easier. You just sit down and I'm quite, I'm actually incredibly comfortable there. It can be a bit weird when you're on your own, uh, which rarely ha happens less now. It did happen to me the other week and actually it was all right. Um, so reason two is sort of, I'm, I'm trying, the thing I am transforming, I'm realizing is myself or allowing us, hopefully allowing myself to be transformed. I think I'm, Got a lot of anger. I couldn't be involved in Just Stop Oil at the moment because I'm too angry. Um, so this year I'm sort of sorting some things out, I'm drawn back a little bit from CCA um, because I'm very, very easily triggered for various reasons. But I can pray and I can allow God to transform me, and I know that's that's uh, that's a really important thing to be doing. And maybe down the line I'll be doing actions. Um, I'm not sure I would see vigil as an action. I don't want to utilize it in that way. I think that's potentially very dangerous. Prayer and vigil are their own thing. They don't need to be justified as an action. Uh, but th I'm aware that this prepares me to be a better person at any level, you know, in action for the climate, should that be the way I go. Three, it's prophetic. Um, Helen put up some of the quotes, Helen put up uh, the. Um, Akoma Lafay, I'm not sure if I pronounced his name right, but I, and um, the Aaron Dutty Roy quotes. So we, hello, Kat. Um, we're creating the possibility, we're, we're bearing witness the world can be different. And I think that's what happens. Then there's the encounter um, of people passing. And of course, Parliament Square, we have everyone go by. Um, and I try and list the politicians I've met, but I haven't met, haven't met, we've met one, two, um, but we're, they're constantly passing us. They don't see us. We're part of the furniture. Um, I literally had walked past Ed, is Ed, isn't it? Yeah, Miliband and two of his um, honchos. And the one word I heard from their conversation was climate. This was when I was walking to the future, which struck me as quite amusing. Um, but we're encountering people and and we are suggesting that another world is possible. And I think the fact that we are silent in our vigil, and there's a lot of noise, Steve Bray particularly, although he's toned it down due to Pretty Patel's new laws. Um, he's the guy with the PA. If you listen to the news and you hear the Benny Hill theme or something, it's him. He's pumping it out over some poor journalist trying to speak. But then there's us and we're silent, but we are up for a chat. And I think we change the dynamic that is prophetic and we're just literally just sitting there um and then one thing kept we had a, a quite an amusing one very unusual a young guy let let rip at us he didn't lose control but he was obviously very angry and it was a very sort of confused right-wing sort of agenda um so we provoked that reaction that's very unusual more often and he was patronizing and i think so you to, to, to two responses patronizing and appreciative and then beyond that there's an in encounter space of i uh, the only thing i really do is make sure i get a picture and i try and put it onto fo facebook and then when i was at green belt or when i'm online people come and they talk about it they obviously think this is a big deal i was watching ruth and helen get arrested so ruth and um sue get arrested uh when when just a boy were doing something in parliament square as we happened to be holding vigil and I thought, well, that's high stakes. And then, but people have see, seem to sort of also think sitting in Parliament Square is high stakes. I don't really find it so, but it's an interesting the reaction it, it gets. Um, and just quickly, I the future. My vision was always that, that I think I, I I think it's a sort of one of those God given visions when I first became part of XR. I, I could imagine, and we started the vigil maybe was I could imagine I had this sort of idea that we would see thousands of Christians or hundreds at least doing this around the country. And then what Helen's just said is really sort of prompted me to think we they might not be churchgoers. I thought they would be, and I'm beginning to 
revisit that. Maybe they won't. But there'll be people who are seeking that other, that Aaron Dutty Roy, you know, that, that other world that's coming. Um, so people of faiths and, and 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 none, all faiths and none, which is of course also um point out how the uh Lent vigil started. Um and we when we meet in Parliament, we have um, at least one Buddhist sit with us. Um so and I'm and I'm on a dilemma. But I, I'm very clear this is not an action, and I wouldn't, and I don't want it ever to be defined as such. And I think there's a there's always going to be that danger because I want to see more Christians to whom who could not take direct do do not feel direct actions with him, but feel that they'd be safe on the vigil. My dilemma though is this: that it would be very useful to get arrested, <laughs> praying, <laughs> because it would just be like, oh, that would be brilliant. It would be brilliant for me. I'd be happy to go there not so brilliant for some other people involved so i just hope it's me because yeah great all right argue your way out of that one then you know you i'm just praying in a christian country you know we i play all of those things and i would play them to the hill so it's very so it's another reason that i do find when i'm sitting there i think i'm just building up the hours in the bank and just like should that ever happen i'll point back to all those time all those photographs and say we've been here a long time this is fits into this discourse um yeah, if someone was so stupid to arrest us for doing something like this. Uh, excuse me, Count, I need that back. Get off. And um, I think that's me. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I'm going to um, open up for questions or, or comments. Before I do, I just want to remind people that uh, this is something that everyone can do local to them uh, or to come up and join the vigil that happens at uh, Parliament Square between 11 and 3. Almost every Wednesday, we, we have a WhatsApp group for the logistics of that that you can join. Um, or whenever we take action now, frequently vigil and prayer is a non-arrestable part of that because we support all our actions with prayer and we always have but it's tended previously to be either online or separate but we're now building this into all our actions so if you think that that is something that you feel you could do then you can sort of join in cca's action space and say actually my role in these actions is to come along and be a visible source of prayer 